everyone, and welcome back to another episode. My name is Dana. I am your host, and my guest today is Mr. Vincent Scott. Hello, Vince. How are you? Hello, Dana. Great to be with you today. Great for you to be here. So before we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about you, a little bit about what you do, all that kind of good stuff. Yeah, my name is Vince Scott. I'm the founder of Defense Cybersecurity Group. Uh, we are a consulting company that focuses on helping DOD contractors uh, prepare for uh, their compliance requirement around cybersecurity. And we also help them uh, do what I consider to be real security, right? How do we how do we take these compliance requirements, measure that, uh, marry that up with your real requirements uh, from a risk perspective so that we can better protect your organization? Fantastic. And there's a lot of that needed out there. And today we're going to talk about basic self-assessments. Now, I have to ask you, is this like an official term, basic self-assessment, or is this do we just like basic self-assessment? This is an official term that exists in the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulation Supplement, or DFARS, regulation that says if you process, handle, or store controlled unclassified information, or CUI, that every three years you must conduct a basic self-assessment you must score that and you must give your score to the Department of Defense in their supplier performance risk system. Okay, fantastic. So now we know. So do, does everybody refer to it as a BSA? I know there's a million acronyms out there or is it just still the basic self-assessment? I think basic self-assessment is more common. I use BSA quite a bit because I talk about basic self-assessment so much, yep. but yep. it's not widely used. Okay, all right. So you kind of touched a little bit on this, but what else would you like to talk about? What is a basic self-assessment? Well, it, it is founded in regulation, and it is one of three kinds of assessments that are founded in the regulation currently. So this is not CMMC the future. Someday we're going to get a rule on this. This is live today. And those three types of assessments are the basic self-assessment, a medium assessment, and a high assessment. Mediums and highs are done by the government. So the Defense Contract Management Agency, DCMA, Defense Industrial Base, Cybersecurity Assessment Center, DIBCAC, so DCMA, DIBCAC, does these assessments. So they'll call you up and say, we're coming. Hope you're ready. Mm -hmm. um, a medium, they generally call you up and say, send me your documentation. We're going to, it's a documentation only review primarily. They want to look through your documentation. They score you based on your documentation and they don't look for evidence and stuff beyond that. A DIPCAC high, they actually come on site. They want to look for evidence and it's much more in depth. You are required to have a score um, for a contract to be awarded to you uh, that has the clause. Now, there's some conversation in the contracting community about if you don't currently have controlled and classified information, does the clause apply to you? Uh, technically, that's true. However, when your contracting officer says you have to have this or your prime contractor says you have to have that, uh, and for, for very large prime contractors who have lawyers on staff who can go down and argue this stuff, uh, maybe that's a, an, a viable approach. I think for most companies, uh, when the government or your prime contractor comes and says you have to do this, then then you got to do this. Yeah, it doesn't sound like that would be a very advantageous to be like <laughs> start butting heads when they start asking for information. Well, and well, it's not easy. You know, it takes some work to do a basic self assessment. Mm -hmm. In the argument about I don't have CUI, I also talk about this in terms of a be prepared to order. So if the government anticipates that they might send you CUI under your contract. If I'm a contracting officer, I want to require you to have this done so that we know that you can handle that information, whether or not have, you have any today. And there's there's been you know professional differences of opinion about that. I, effectively, I think it's a be prepared to order, and you're going to have to perform your basic self-assessment. Are, is there any association with the basic, middle, and high with the new CMMC levels? Or with the CMMC levels? Not really. Okay. Really, they're all level two because they all look at companies that have 
control and classified information. It's just, do you do it yourself? Did the government do it just a little bit? Does the government do it a lot is really the difference between the three types. All right. Good stuff. Okay. So when do we have to conduct one? Uh, when your government contracting officer or prime contractor tells you to primarily, the rule was established in November of 2020. So almost two years ago now. And what the rule says is that in order to be awarded a contract, a contract extension or a contract mod, if you process, handle or source a UI, you have to have a score. I realized that not all contracting officers and prime contractors are insisting on that today universally it is the requirement though so if you fall into that circumstance and nobody has made you do it yet they very likely are going to at some point that they're going to turn around and go oh give me your stuff because it's another thing i have to have and i hadn't realized i'm supposed to be checking for that so mm -hmm. my recommendation is for those companies that handle cui or plan to uh, you absolutely should have a current basic self-assessment that you have done Okay. So now how do we conduct one? Well, there is a methodology for this. And that methodology is kind of hard to dig out. There is a DCMA methodology for assessments that po that's posted deep in the web and hard to find from a simple Google search. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to go to my uh, homepage, www.cybersecgru.com. Uh, I have a helpful links page. It has it on there. Uh, or, you know, reach out and we, I'm happy to send it. I, I send it out all the time because people don't know about it. It's a method that, that enables you to score based on how many controls or security requirements you've got in place as required in the standard. And they essentially have five point, three point and one point controls. You start out with 110 points and everyone you're missing, you subtract five, three or one from. And therefore, it is highly possible to have a negative SBRS score. So if I scored a 56, that doesn't mean I'm 56 percent. Uh, that really means I'm closer to 80 percent. Uh, if I'm 50%, I'm really operating in negative numbers because there's a total of 313 points, uh, at, because they weighted the, the 110 controls and more than half of them are weighted three or five. So that, that, that's why you have that strange scoring methodology, mm -hmm. but there is a process and you need to understand that. And I, I've certainly seen companies that went in and, and counted up all the controls. Hey, I've got 110 controls. I'm doing 86 of them. My score is 86. Yeah. Yep. That's not actually accurate. You have not followed the methodology. Um, the other thing about the methodology that is critical, and it's also critical for CMMC, is it requires you to use assessment objectives. So every one of those 110 controls is broken down into a series of assessment objectives, one or more, one to seven or eight. And usually most of them are two or three. You have to be met for all the assessment objectives associated with the control in order to be met for the control and get the points. So that's another thing that I see is companies, they're doing the scoring, but they're not using the assessment objectives as part of determining whether or not a control is met or not. And uh, they're giving themselves credit because and they, they believe that, that yeah. oh, yeah, I do that. Uh, but then when you break this down by assessment objectives and say, well, you do you do this and do this and do this? Well, yeah, that third one I don't do. I, not met. It's not a two thirds of a point. It's no points. And that's what I think is going to be one of the big problems with when the auditors come out to do for the CMMC assessments, because exactly like you're saying, they're yes. saying, well, we, we do do that. Okay, well, do you do this and this and this? Well, like you said, oh, no, we don't do that third part. And that's where I think a lot of the problems are going to pop up. And that will result in a not met. So we, mm -hmm. we talk about this all the time that says it is critical for both the basic self-assessment and your long-term CMMC journey. You have to be tracking this through the lens of the 320 assessment objectives, not the 110 controls. All right. Very good point. Very good point. Okay. So do we need to submit our score and do we need to submit our score to our prime? Yes, you do need to submit your score to the government. 
you do not need to submit your score to the prime. That is not a requirement under the regulation. Primes will probably ask for your score. Mm -hmm. And that's a matter of contractual negotiation between you and your prime contractor. They have a responsibility under the regulation to know that you have submitted a score and they cannot see your entry in the government's database. So they can't go in and check that you have a score submitted. They have to ask you for that. Uh, the way I, where I have responsibilities as a prime contractor have addressed that is that I want to see a snapshot of your SBRS entry, right? Just take a screen snap of it and send it to me. If you, and I've had subcontractors do this, blank the score out so that I don't know what the score is. Okay. I still have a response. I have to have something so that I can fulfill my responsibility under the regulation that you actually have a score submitted. I got to have something, but uh, I don't technically need to have your score and I don't need to have your documentation. I, I don't need to have your system security plan or other documentation. Some prime contractors will ask for that as well. I think it's typical for subcontractors to do a, like a screen share only. Hey, I'll have, we'll have a, a VTC or a webinar. We'll get together. I'll pull up my system security plan. We'll walk through it and talk you to it, but I'm not going to send you a copy of it. That's typically what I'm seeing. But again, that's a matter of negotiation between you and your prime contractor. I personally am not as concerned about the operational security aspects of your system security plan. So many professionals in the space, very worried about the sensitivity of your system security plan, because if a hacker had a copy of that, it would know where you don't have controls implemented, right? Are you having a hard time finding new customers? A lot of folks just like you in the IT and cybersecurity space are in the same situation. And they have embraced a new opportunity to get new clients. They're doing this by growing their online presence and maximizing the power of LinkedIn. How, you ask? I have a tried and tested method called my cyber social program. I myself have been on LinkedIn, and now have over 3.5 million LinkedIn views, and over on YouTube, I have over 750,000 video views. So I can show you exactly how I have done that so that you can promote your organization and become the authority in your industry. And the best part is, I've done all of this organically without one paid ad. You don't need to waste your money over on Google with pay-per-click ads. Now's the time to establish yourself. Look around. The competition isn't doing it. This is your time to shine online before they do. So if you're ready to start your online journey and future-proof your business, please, down below, click the link and schedule a time for us to have a 45-minute call where I can review the exact methodology of the Cyber Social Program. You can also click below to see some of my master classes, which will give you quick little snippets of a couple of things you can do right away on LinkedIn that will help with your profile. I hope to see you and hear from you soon. Uh, I don't think any hacker has ever pulled up somebody's system security plan to see where they have controls implemented or not. And the reason for that is, is and, and as a guy who has played offense previously, I don't care where you think you have controls. I care where they really are. And, and it's very typical for me also from my you know, years of incident response experience and most in, incidents where we go to dig in with a company <clears throat> and IT tells me, yeah, we're absolutely configured this way. And they're, they're being completely honest. This is what they believe to be the case. And then we go and dig in and we go, well, what about this? And they go, oh, <laughs> we didn't know about that. Oh, I thought we were good everywhere. Um, I had a Fortune 500 company with an incident uh, related to Eternal Blue, a, uh, a, a zero day stolen from NSA, right? And then uh, weaponized in the wild. And they were completely patched for Eternal Blue. We, we've done this everywhere. We've got a great package. Oh, but the monitors in the cafeteria, they put up the lunch menu. Oh, no. We didn't, we didn't know about those. We don't have those on our patching list, but they're computers. Mm -hmm. And guess who got, it, who got infected with internal blue, right? And then, and then you know, there were a number of other instances like that where they ended up finding out where they, they had holes in their vulnerability. 
uh, mm -hmm. process, right? And that was, um, I think that's very typical. So I'm not particularly concerned about the operational security of your system security plan, because I don't think it, it provides it much advantage to a hacker, uh, as many security professionals believe it does. Okay. Well, that's good to know. That's definitely a good way to look so, at so it. Yeah, I, I, I'm not particularly uh, cagey mm -hmm. about not sharing my system security plan with somebody who really needs I want to send it to them securely. We're going to do it yeah. encrypted, et cetera. But if you want to have it and have a look at it, that nah. um, because I think from a hacker perspective, it is much more likely that they, they're just going to see what they can do. Mm -hmm. They're not documentation people. They, they're not compliance right. people. They probably don't even care what a system security plan is. Mm -hmm. They care what they can do. And they're going to go try to do things, right? Yep. Um, okay. So do we need to submit our SSP and our POAM? No, not to the government. And of course, it's not required to your prime, although the prime may ask for it. But the government particularly says, don't send it to me. Uh, so there's two ways to submit your score. One is directly into the portal, the supplier performance risk system. And you have to do some work to get access to the portal so that you can Submit that, but that's the best way to do it. There's no place in there to submit. You just type in the number, right, and the date, and when you think you're going to be done. It's it's very simplistic. There is also an email method. There's an email address where you can submit your SBRS score, and then they will manually enter it for you. Uh, do not attach your SSP and your POEM to that. They don't want to see it. They don't want to be burdened with that information. They have no place to put it in the portal. Uh, it's going to go in the rubbish bin. So, no, you do not need to submit your SSP and POEM. If your prime contractor wants to see it, like I said, most people are having a, a conference and then just showing it to them rather than sending it to them, but I'm not particularly concerned about its sensitivity. I think there's a lot more to be concerned about if it doesn't look very good. Then, then, <laughs> then that's the, really the problem here isn't, how, oh, I'm very operationally secure and I would never share that is an excuse to cover for, no, really probably doesn't look very good and it's not done. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, there's not a requirement. One thing, don't you think that moving forward that the prime, you know, this whole, well, I'm just a sub, it doesn't really matter, that the primes are going to require this because, you know, this is important stuff that I know not a lot of people are taking seriously right now, but eventually they are going to need to take it seriously and, this is just, again, good business practices as a prime to make sure, really make sure that you're, who you're doing business with as a sub is doing what they should do. They're going to be required to because if there's a breach, that prime is potentially responsible. Uh, uh, accountability is going to come for you eventually. When that accountability is going to show up is, is going to vary greatly across the defense industrial mm -hmm. base. Uh, I think certification under the CMMC program is going to be the future easy button. Right. I don't need to see your SSP. I don't need to see your POEM. I don't need to know your score. If you got a CMMC certification, then I know that you're good because somebody came out and looked at you and attested that you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. And you're going to I am already seeing that from big prime contractors are asking in their questionnaires that they send out. Are you CMMC certified? And if not, when are you going to be? That's typical wow. in those questionnaires. So you're seeing that already. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, across, uh, you know, five or six big boys I can think of. I've seen the questionnaires. Um, I, I get it because I have clients who come to me and say, hey, we got this questionnaire. What do we say? Uh, so I get to, you know, I see those questionnaires about what kind of questions they're asking. And are you certified? Which, of course, nobody is. Mm -hmm. And when do you plan to be is a typical question. And then they ask you about your SVRS score and when your poem is going to be closed. Well, this is the me message we all need to get out there into the world that, you know, these questions are coming. And even though, though it's not finalized, you're definitely going to get it's time to get dragged together. Yes, it's, this is non-trivial and it takes time to put these things into place. Mm -hmm. Yep. OK, is the DOD using our score to make award decisions? The DOD is not currently using your score to make an award decision. They just want your score. So they... If you send them a score of negative uh, 56, it does not impact your award dec decision. It's just about, do you have a score or don't you have a score? That is the requirement. Now, in the future, I 
I've heard discussions that that might change. Uh, however, today you don't need to worry about your score. And my recommendation to people is give yourself an accurate score, do yourself a favor and really understand where you're at relative to this. Because the CMMC requirement is 110 out of 110. Mm -hmm. And that's a very high bar. Uh, DibCAC recently published slides in the uh, CMMC town hall for September, where they talked about what they are seeing from in terms of aggregate SPRS scores. And they said the average SPRS score today is 56 positive. When they do a medium assessment of those companies they've done a medium assessment on, the average score is actually negative 57. <laughs> so that's more than a hundred point swing to the negative. In, in the medium assessment is just a paperwork assessment. Hey, mm -hmm. send me your SSP, send me your POEM, send me your policies and procedures. We'll go look through those and we'll give you a score. So that that that's not a particularly deep look that where evidence is required. So you may expect that score to fall further if I have a CMMC assessment going on where that assessor is requiring you to provide at least one form of evidence that you're actually meeting this control above and beyond. I, I just, I wrote it down that I was going to do that. That's great. Now show, show me your mm -hmm. firewall. Uh, and, and I can tell you from my own experience going through this, uh, creating what I call an evidence locker, which maybe is a, a completely separate topic. I think everybody should have one who's going to be CMMC. When you go look at this and say, okay, we're good. Let's go gather evidence for this. I need a screenshot. I need to look at the firewall rules. I need to, to show that the configuration of my laptops meets the requirements of this setting that we said we're doing. I found places where that wasn't as good as I thought it was, right? Be, and IT was like, oh, well, we meant to do that. Or uh we didn't know that was a requirement I, i've had a couple of those where we as we dug in for evidence we started figuring out well what do i what does evidence look like if i'm going to prove this we think we're good now i have to prove that we're good let's go dig into that and then we find out ooh, there was there was another piece of this i didn't understand that mm -hmm. we need to go do right so th that gathering of evidence is good for you in order to prepare it's also a higher bar than that negative 110 point uh, swing that you're seeing from a medium assessment. Well, I think it even goes back to just some basic business models of saying, you know, trust, but verify, you know, you could say, oh yeah, we're doing that. We're definitely doing that. Cause you think really in your hearts of hearts, you probably could pass a polygraph test. Yes, we are doing that. But then have you checked, you know, have you verified that this is actually being done? So yeah. going and collecting the evidence is a perfect way to. Yeah. It really drives a lev level of detail and integrity in your process. When you say, I am going to gather a piece of evidence for every one of these assessment objectives, and I'm going to have that in SharePoint or a share drive or a thing, a place. And under CMMC, the CMMC C3 PAO, the assessment company is going to want to know that you have evidence prepared. That's part of the pre-assessment process. Mm -hmm. So depending on how the cap, the CMMC assessment process is updated uh, right now in, in the draft, that's a requirement. You got to have it. You got to be able to show that you've got a, a body of evidence that makes it reasonable that you're going to pass an assessment before we even start. Um, and, it, and it's really good for you as a company that that intellectual rigor you go through yes. to, I need to develop evidence for every one of those. Uh, drives you to another level of fidelity on what you've got going on in your environment. Yeah, absolutely. That hunting around is definitely going to help with that. All right. So what changes can we expect to basic self-assessments under CMMC? I think the biggest thing that we've heard that under the new CMMC rule, as the, the we expect to see them published in March, that they have said the basic self-assessment requirement is going to go from every three years to every year and it's they're going to add the requirement that it's attested to by a c-suite individual in the company so I, I see a lot of companies today where you know the it manager in the compliance 
department or in the networks department who got stuck with CMMC, is he actually the person who does the self-assessment and upload, uploads the score? And it, it doesn't necessarily have executive visibility other than did we submit our score? Yes, we did. Okay, great. We're good. Mm -hmm. In the future, that's going to be different. And I think as CMMC inspections start to roll out, if you're overly enthusiastic in your scoring of yourself, you give yourself 110 and really you're negative 57, uh, you, and now you're inviting independent assessors in to come verify this, uh, you open yourself up to more False Claims Act risk. And that executive whose name is on that, that they were 110 and they're not, potentially becomes personally liable. So I hope that that is going to drive uh, executive interaction and enthusiasm for getting this right. Yeah, and I, it's funny, I really want to do a whole little video on that, just the false claims of actually what's happening with the person that's putting their John Hancock on there, and then the whole whistle whistleblower application that's going to come into play with all this stuff too. So maybe we could talk about that another time too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, this is really, really good. Is there anything else you want to throw out there before we go? I think everybody should be doing thinking about doing a basic self-assessment in the next six months because the change of the change in the rule that we anticipate in March, most people did this back in November, December of 2020. So it's two years old. You have the potential for your basic self-assessment to go instantly out of date and maybe not even realize it because you're not paying that close of attention, right? You did this. It was good. We moved beyond that. That was two years ago. Oh, wait a minute. They changed the rule. And then you have a contract award that's held up or goodness forbid lost because you did not have the score, a current score in the system. Uh, I would hate to, I know how hard dip contractors work to win government work. It can take them years. I would hate to see something like that prevent uh, a company from winning a contract. So my recommendation to everybody is do a basic self-assessment in the next six months and do it right in accordance with uh, the DCMA methodology. And we're going to put that link to your website so that people can go and click on that so that they can get a little bit more guidance on that. Oh, one last thing. I have also spreadsheeted that that scoring thing. So the, the DCMA methodology doesn't have that. It's not really high speed. But if you go in there and click and download my spreadsheet, there's a basic self-assessment tab in that which uh, is part of my overall CMMC spreadsheet of excellence about how to track your program, but all the point values and what it says, so you can just fill in the links and it adds your score up at the end and you don't have to build that spreadsheet uh, is already out there. Downloadable for free. So that's great. So that they can go, they can get themselves started. And then if they have any questions or anything, then they can reach out to you. And maybe Absolutely. you're a wealth of knowledge with this. So that would be the smart thing to do. Thank you. Yeah, no, you are. <laughs> you know that. <laughs> All right. Well, this was great. Thank you, Vince, for your time. And thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll see you on the next episode. Until then, bye-bye. Thanks, Santa.